Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to Cytobank webinars. Uh, my name is Liz Johannesson. I am the webinar lead here at Cytobank and we have with us Chen Zhen Zheng, our senior application scientist who will be presenting the overview of Flowsum in Cytobank. We're very excited to debut this functionality in our application this week. And we have a very special guest joining us uh, today for the Q&A as well as for um, the presentation, and that is Sophie Van Gassen. Sophie is the original co-author of the algorithm, as well as the seminal paper that you may or may not have had an opportunity to read, and has also been a terrific collaborator with us um, as, we, as we implement FlowSOM in Cytobank. So thank you so much for joining us, um, Sophie and Chen Zhen, and I'll just go ahead and let Chen Zhen take it away. Great, thanks Liz for the introduction. Good morning everyone, this is Chen Zhen. Thanks for attending the webinar today. I'm so humbled to have many of you join us. We have historical high registration today. Thanks Sophie for that. So it's our honor to have Sophie with us. Today for the first part of the webinar, I will do a quick slide presentation of FlowSum in Cytobank. Then we'll have a QA session for the second half. We have very mixed audience today. For those who are not familiar with FlowSum, it is a clustering algorithm that was first created and published by Sophie back in 2015. It has been adopted by the field quickly since then due to its speed and the great visualization features. Cytobank is the only cloud-based platform that implemented FlowSum with a user-friendly interface for biologists. So in the field, there has been a huge advancement for single cell analysis and cytometry technology in the past 30 years. Back in the early 90s, Fax Caliber was a state of art instrument, if you can believe that. The fact that you can measure up to four parameters was a big deal. And then in the early 2000s, that was a breakthrough by Mario Roder at NIH. He did a 11 color phenotyping on CD4 naive T cell and published on Nature Medicine. But nowadays, a 10 to 20 color panel is routinely used in many labs with some of the most commonly available cytometers in the range. Then on the high end, we have Fax Symphony, which can measure up to 28 colors. There's also this full spectrum cytometer from Arola that overcome the bottleneck of compensation issue and able to do more than 20 colors with just two lasers. Of course, um, with the CYTOF, the mass cytometry technology, which has really pushed the field of single cell analysis toward high dimensional. Theoretically, the latest hero can measure up to 100 parameters and has been routinely used for measure up to 50 parameters simultaneously. So the whole field is going toward high dimensional and high throughput. Billions of data points are measured. The importance is that this imposes huge challenge on data analysis. So let's look at the traditional data analysis. Manual gating was and still is the gold standard. However, it has its limitation when it comes to high dimensional data. So traditionally, we use by x plots to visualize the markers and a gate on population of inches by two markers at a time. We usually have predetermined approach and gating strategies based on the known expression of markers on various lineages and subpopulations. When we have seven channels based on the combination formula here, there will be 21 plots total. So this is probably not too difficult to um, get what you need to do with the data set. However, when we go to high dimensional, in this case, I have 24 channels. A total of 276 plots will be generated for the marker combination. This is well beyond our human brain can possibly interpret. It is also difficult to comprehend the correlations among three or more markers from a series of 2D plots. So it is not scalable with increased number of dimensionality. Not only that, there are other limitations on the manual gating that it's 
highly subjective. Variabilities can be introduced by different experts and gating strategies used. This is a graph shows the same person using different gating strategies to define subsets. You can see the huge variabilities among different strategies for especially the NK cells and the uh, CD16 monocytes. And the same, um, there are experts variability as well. A dozen of scientists from different labs gate on the same subsets to define this particular cytokine secretion cells. You will see uh, huge variabilities among different scientists. Lastly, the manual gating approach relies on researchers' prior knowledge, thus introducing a bias toward expected results. Due to this, much of the potential relevant and novel information within the data set might not be recognized and could be missed. So I would say high dimensional data is difficult to visualize. Here, we may all heard of this Indian proverb, uh, blind man and an elephant. It is a story of a group of blind men who have never come across an elephant before and who learn and conceptualize what is the elephant by touching it. Each blind man feels a different part of the elephant's body, but only one part, such as the side or the tusk. Then describe the elephant based on their limited experience and their description of the elephant. So high dimensional data is kind of like this elephant. It's enormous amount of information. We need to combine information from all dimensions in order to be confident and make the true discovery that this is indeed an elephant. And not only that, we want to know this is elephant. We also want to know the shape, the color, all the characteristics of the system, the same with our biological system. Cytomics is a way to measure all features of all cells using all tools, not only limited to cytometry methods. So here uh, we show, you know, the myeloid cell system before the age of high dimensional analysis. Um, and then by the modern technique, we are able to deep profiling the system in more details with different um, subsets. So in the field of computational cytometry, there are uh, two major categories for the machine learning algorithm, supervised and unsupervised. So the unsupervised algorithm consider all dimensions simultaneously and lays all the populations present in the sample. Many of the dimension reduction and the clustering tools belong to this group. And the supervised algorithm use some pre-knowledge such as you know, CD34 is a stem cell marker, or uh, this is patient group and this is healthy group. Here is a great nature review article from Ivan Seis and Sophie on computational cytometry. It's nicely written and very enjoyable to read. I would suggest you all to have access to it if you are interested in having a comprehensive overview of the computational cytometry. Here's some examples of the machine learning algorithm available to the general public. So under the supervised category, both Wanderlust and Citrus are great. The Citrus requires at least two groups and eight samples each. It's a powerful statistical tool to find differential expression between groups or identify features that best predict responder and non-responders. And then here, both PCA and the VISNI are dimension reduction tools for explorative data analysis without prior knowledge. You're probably already very familiar with the VISNI, which reduce in dimensional to 2D dimension while still preserving the high dimension information, grouping your events by similarity of their marker expression. And then down here, Venograph, Spade, and Fulsome are all clustering tools that automatically group the cells into clusters that have similar marker expression. Spade probably is one of the earliest algorithms that was developed for mass cytometry data out of Gary Nolan's lab in Stanford. 
is a powerful hierarchical clustering analysis tool that clusters cells in a minimum spanning tree. And FlowSum is very similar to SPAY, but much faster with more enhanced visualization. We will talk in more details later. So Cytobank has most of those tools available in a cloud-based uh, platform. Nowadays, data size gets much bigger and bigger. More and more computer resources are needed for the machine learning algorithm. Cytobank meets the demand by providing cloud-based big data management and cloud compute for the algorithm. It's made for biologists, so no coding language is required. Very user-friendly and computer-friendly too, as all the analysis are done on the cloud and not on your local computer. Your computer probably will thank you for not overloading it. Here is a comprehensive view uh, of the tools available in Cytobank. Uh, the data can be cytometry data, but it can also be uh, on a seek or any other tabular data. We have a tool in Cytobank called Jock that you can convert any CSV files into FCS format. Then we also have the Cytobank API to connect with your other algorithms. In, of course, our strength is at cloud-based machine learning algorithm. In addition to the existing Spade, Visney, and Stitches, now we have FlowSum available. Here are some example views of Cytobank's implementation of those algorithms. Spade tree here, uh, we have Visney map and the FlowSum in a minimum spanning tree, uh, which we will talk in details next. So what is FlowSum? FlowSum is a algorithm that are using self-organizing map for flow cytometry data analysis. So SUM is a type of artificial neural network in which nodes can be represented in a two-dimensional grid. The SUM training does not require any subsampling, which makes it very fast. It also uses hierarchical clustering for meta clusters to group clusters together based on their phenotypic similarity. FlowSum also has excellent visualization tools like Spade. FlowSum use minimum spanning tree to present the data. The star charts allows multiple parameter visualization on the same tree to have an overview of all markers on all cells. It also uses pie charts for an easy comparison to your manual gating. So I will show you how it works and what it looks like in the next few slides. There are four steps in the algorithm. First, the FCS files are pre-processed, including compensated, transformed, then concatenated and scaled, resulting in this matrix with a row for every cell with each marker in the, uh, as, a, as a column here. Then a self-organizing map is trained on the matrix. The resulting is the grade of nodes. Each node is a cell cluster. Visualization can be done uh, showing the mean marker values of each node in star charts or use pie charts for comparison to the manual gating. Then a minimum spanning tree is built. The same star charts and the pie charts can be visualized on those trees. We can also show marker expression on the tree exactly like spade. And the last step is meta clusters are defined, use the cluster that were generate, generated by the sum, indicated by the background of each node. The meta cluster can be also showed on, in a grade or in a tree. Here show the star charts with minimum spanning tree in more detail. So each circle here is a cluster. The clusters that are close to each other are more similar than the clusters that are far apart. Within the cluster, the star charts show the marker expression. And the height of each marker show uh, the expression level. The marker that reach all the way to the top has a high expression. This allows multiple parameter visualization 
in the same plot. So more information can be shown in a single plot so that you can have an overview of all markers on all cells that way. Here's another visualization tool with pie charts. On the left is the manual gating, the color cross response to the pie uh, chart inside of each cluster. Flowsum also uh, for the option of including meta clusters, the meta cluster function to group the nodes together based on their phenotypic similarity. The background color uh, of the cluster indicating a meta cluster, um, the color here across response to the meta cluster ID here. So this can be used to define large cell populations like CD4 T cells, CD8 T cells, B cells, and monocytes. Here's another visualization approach we mentioned earlier where each marker expression is shown on the clusters on, in the minimum spanning tree, uh, very similar to the spade um, presentation interpretation of the data. So we have talked about what is flow sum. Um, now the question is why flow sum, right? Uh, the biggest selling point here is that flow sum is very fast. Flowsum used the sum for clustering instead of the hierarchical clustering used by spade, eliminating the need for density dependent downsampling, thus is very fast, faster than spade. Here we have a comparison of runtime with spade with varying number of cells from 0.5 million to uh, 3 million. It takes only seconds to many for flowsum to complete run, while it takes spade um, an hours to two hour, uh, almost two hours to run with three million events. If you are using Spade within Cytobank, you'll probably take this time for a lunch break or something while Spade is running on the cloud. But two hours lunch break probably is a bit too luxury if you ask me. So unfortunately with Folsom, your lunch break is over and you are ready to present the data within minutes. Flowsum also stands well when compared to other clustering tools regard to runtime. Here's a site of data set with about 26,000 event 32 channels. It takes less than a minute for Flowsum. And it takes about 30 minutes for a phenograph and then a couple hours for some of the other clustering tools. So Flowsum will be really a time saver for those who are working with big data. And I will show more stats later. Now we all know Flowsum is awesome. Flowsum is super fast. But then why Cytobank? People will say, you know, I'm very savvy with R and I would like to run on my computer. When we implemented Flowsum in Cytobank, we take the advantage of cloud compute so that you can run um, multiple analysis in parallel with different settings. Cytobank is also able to take in a lot more data. We can run up to 90 million events with upgrade compute. Here I show um, a Flowsum running in Cytobank with a very number of events. You can see that for most of the data set under 5 million, it takes less than 10 minutes. That's the majority of our user will experience. On the regular size, such as the premium and enterprise, the cap is 4 million. So no more lunch break, maybe the results will be ready by the time you grab in coffee. However, uh, if you, you also have the option to feed the algorithm uh, with 30 million or more, um, 30 million uh, many events will finish around an hour. It is quite a lot of events and most computer will probably crash at this point, not to mention uh, 90 million, but with cloud computing, it's, it's possible and it's very fast. Another important thing is that Folsom is very powerful, but it relies on stochastic minimum spanning tree. There is randomness associated with it which result in non-identical trees with potentially different branching structure each time you run it. 
So in Settle Bank, you can not only run multiple files concurrently, but also able to reuse an existing sum for new samples to have consistent results. Here we show two samples for two different flow sum runs that share the same sum. They have the same minimum spending tree branches so that you can easily compare the differences between those two samples. You will see, you know, some of the cell abundance is different, the size of the cluster is different. Um, over here, uh, you can easily detect the differences between the two samples, especially if you highlight them with functional markers. So another important feature in Cytobank is that a new flow sum experiment will be created after the analysis. Once the analysis is done in Cytobank, there are two options. Either download the results as PDF or CSV files from the download tab. Uh, that's the results I showed you earlier uh, with all the trees and also the grades, uh, pie charts. Or uh, you can uh, view this newly created experiment. With this new experiment, it contains the FCS file with the original channels, as well as flow sum cluster and the meta cluster ID channels. There are many options for downstream data analysis and uh, visualization. We also automatically gate on those meta clusters. It will show up as flow cell meta cluster one up to the number you used to define the number of meta clusters. The default is 10. You also have the option to merge the clusters using the automatic gating function. Because we normally select more clusters than needed so that the rare populations will be separated from the larger populations. In this case, we can merge clusters with similar phenotype later in this user interface. So the newly generated meta cluster gates now can serve as new populations that you can use for downstream analysis, such as a heat map or um, overlay with your Visni map, which we'll show later. So inside the bank, we treat data analysis as pipeline that after run dimension reduction tools like Visni, you can run some other clustering algorithm on top of that uh, or vice versa to have a better visualization and interpretation of your data. Here we show running Visni on the newly created flow sum experiment after the flow sum analysis. So the generated file now has a VSNI coordinates, TSNI1 and TSNI2, as well as the meta cluster gates. Now you can overlay your uh, flow sum defined meta clusters on the VSNI map to check on the cluster quality to see if how well that match to the VSNI, def uh, VSNI defined population or your manually defined gates here. Of course, we can use heat map to show the channel expression on those meta clusters to define the phenotypic of those meta clusters. Uh, don't worry if you get lost here. Um, we will, you will have the chance to sign up with Settle Bank and try it out yourself. We have detailed instruction on our support portal to show how to get the map like this. And also demo data on uh, the premium and enterprise sites. So here I will show the user interface of FlowSum in Settlebank. FlowSum is under the advanced analysis along with other algorithm. You can start a um, new analysis here. You can give your FlowSum analysis a name. So it's okay. So in that, with that interface, now you can choose your starting population. You can choose the input samples you would like to run. 
down here you can choose the clustering channels so we normally choose all the surface cd markers of course you can do samplings uh, then here you can choose to create either create a new sum or use an existing sum. The cluster methods used for meta clustering and the number of meta cluster you can define. Uh, you can also define the number of clusters over here, the number of iterations, and then choose the seed, control the seed, uh, the PDF output settings down here. So then once you're done, you can click on run analysis. This will send a request to the cloud and put your analysis in queue. And it should be done once it takes in the queue, it should be done in a few minutes. So feel free to try it out with your own data to see how fast it is. So with that, I am ending my talk here. So feel free to sign up for the 30 day free trial if you are not already a Cytobank Bank user. We have excellent support portal for articles and videos. I will also encourage you to try Flowsum out with your own data. We'll be excited to see how Flowsum can help with your scientific project and we'll be happy to feature you for future webinars. Now, please take advantage of this rare opportunity to ask any some related question to Sophie. I will also be happy to take any uh, Cytobank related question. So now let's start with a Q&A session with Sophie. Let me see. Uh, we already have many of the questions comes in already. So um, one of the questions is, so what's the difference between Frosum and Spade? Uh, can I get comparable results if run both Frosum and Spade? Um, so Sophie, would you like to take that? Sure. Um, so I think the main difference between Frosum and Spade is actually the clustering algorithm it uses where Flowsum uses the self-organizing map and Spade uses the hierarchical clustering. And I think actually the results would be very comparable. It's mainly the speed that is uh, very different. So Flowsum will run a lot, a lot faster to actually give you a very similar answer. Great. Um, thank you for that. Another question is also related to um, to spade. Uh, so what's the, uh, how sensitive, so when it goes to rare population detection, how sensitive for some and um, how does that compare to spade? Um, I think maybe their spade might be sometimes slightly more sensitive because it does the density based uh, down sampling. This comes of course at uh, quite some computational cost. And also overall in practice, when I've tried it out on, on several um, situations, actually in most cases, either both uh, algorithms did find the rare population or both algorithms didn't find uh, the population. So I think the, the difference is very subtle. Um, and it's also a question I get often asked, like to which percentage of cells can flow some pick up things, but it's very hard to put a number to that because it actually does not only depend on your percentage of cells, but also on how different it is from other cells. So if you have a very small population, but it's completely different from anything else in your sample, probably both spade and flowsome will still pick it up. On the other hand, if it's really quite similar to the, uh, some of the other cell populations in your uh, sample, and only differing in, for example, one marker, the probability is high that in both algorithms, it will be actually merged together uh, with some other population. Great, thanks Sophie for that. Um, here's another question that I just uh, to 
me and um, it says what is the difference between using Cytobank and Flojo with Flowsum? Um, I would be happy to answer that as I have a um, so for for Flojo uh, and uh, Cytobank we both implement Flowsum uh, but it's different because Cyberbank is a cloud-based platform. It can do the flow sum analysis concurrently. Uh, also, it can take in more uh, data than a laptop version. Um, so, and I'll be happy to uh, provide more detailed information um, if you contact by the support portal. Mm, there are a lot of questions. It's keep uh, keep moving. Let me see. Uh, does this also work to find a subpopulation of one percent in a panel that has only markers for CD4 T cells? I think it's an algorithm related question. Sophie, would you like to um, answer that? Yeah, I think it comes back a little bit to to the previous question, where the one percent isn't really enough. It, it depends just also on like. How different is it in these markers you have for the CD4 T cells? Um, how easy it would be to, to detect this population? Actually, in, in most situations, I would think 1% will not be an issue. Uh, this should be really possible to pick up. Maybe two remarks if, if you're facing issues with this. One thing you could do is you can increase the grid size. The more clusters you detect, the the more detail you will pick up and the easier it will be to find rare populations. The other approach uh, you might consider is also to really look um, at what your panel is suited for. Like in this case, if you say, okay, my panel is really focused on markers for CD4 T cells, maybe for your start population, you take the CD4 T cells. You're not really interested in unbiasedly discovering everything that's going on in, for example, the debris in that case, or other cells which are not relevant for these markers. So zooming in on your start population of interest might also help to actually increase the percentage of rare cells that you're looking for. Got it. That's great. So another question from Brent, it says, does the distance between nodes matter with Flosom or just which nodes are connected? Yeah, so that's actually um, good to understand the subtleties of the of the minimal spanning tree. So it's a tree which means there can be no loops. This means that every node is connected to the node which is the most similar to it, but it doesn't necessarily mean that if two nodes are not connected that they are not similar at all. It's just not the most similar node uh, in the data set. Overall, the the length of the edge will kind of indicate how different uh, the cells uh, or, or the, the two clusters are. So it does contain some information, but you need to be careful that you don't start adding the path lengths between all the clusters because that would not make sense. The tree is really mainly a helpful tool to find these branches which contain similar nodes together to make it easier in interpretation. But sometimes it can be very tricky, of course, to capture all that high dimensional information in a 2D structure. So it always needs to be approached with some caution and also checking like what are the marker expressions of these clusters. Um, the next question is um, from anonymous attendees. Uh, do we need to have the same marker in the FCS file in order to run the same sum? Uh, my gut feeling is that you you do need to have the same marker, but I would like to have Sophie to elaborate a little bit more um, using the existing SOM to give identical um, minimum spanning trees and how that's best used in, use, uh, in case scenarios. Yes, yeah, so I think in general, I would certainly strongly recommend to really use the same markers, the same panel, minimize all technical limitations between your samples uh, when running FlowSum on them together. Um, in theory, you could argue that if you just have a certain subset of, of markers which are the same and you only use those for the clustering, it should be possible um, to apply this. 
and, and you could try it out. However, um, Flosome can be quite sensitive to batch effects. This means like if you have a certain shift somewhere, maybe the cells will end up like in the cluster right next to it and, and they will be split out between the batches. And I think if you have a different panel, the probability of this occurring is quite high. And also if you use like just a subset, maybe these other markers still have some influence um, with all the compensation happening and so on. Um, so I, I would be really careful about that and double check that things if, are making sense if you take this approach. In general, the more similar the data is um, in, in panel setup, in the whole experimental procedure, I think the more trustworthy your, data, your conclusions will be. Great, so the next question is more related to the downstream analysis of FlowSum in Cedibank. That I got a few questions that regard to the statistical analysis and how to show the trees within Cedibank. Um, so the answer is yes. So you are able to do all the downstream analysis within the newly created FLOSOM experiment that includes the statistical analysis, the heat map, the illustration, and um, as well as the example I showed earlier where you can map your meta clusters back to the Visni map. However, uh, inside the bank, we do not um, implement the uh, minimum spanning tree, uh, like in spade, a uh, live interaction with the tree. So that uh, that part you can download from the um, DETIC, uh, the results tab, but it's not live inside the bank. However, you are able to interact with your flow summary experiments uh, for the downstream analysis with the new experiments we have. Um, another question is that, is there a rule to choose the number of clusters? Say I have 10 uh, subsets, how many uh, markers should I how many clusters should I choose? Yeah, that's indeed also one of the limitations of FlowSum that we're still actively doing research on, is how many clusters to choose. And it's just a difficult question in, in all um, machine learning applications. My recommendation there is for the clustering itself, so, so the, the sum grid, there you should really over cluster. It's really important to pick up on all small possible differences. And also, sum is very fast, but it's maybe not the smartest clustering algorithm. Um, so there you really want to over cluster to make sure you capture everything. Right now, we're just kind of checking this visually to see that the same marker patterns are appearing multiple times. And that's what we're working on if, if we can automate this further in, in a, a nice computational score. Then for the meta clustering, there you kind of want it to correspond with the marker patterns which are similar. So again, we do a, a kind of visual um, check. In general, it might split some things you don't expect so you would probably increase it a bit to the number you would expect. So if you say you have 10 uh, populations you're looking for, probably you'll use a seven by seven or a 10 by 10 grid, something in that, that range. And then look for maybe 15 uh, meta clusters, for example, to pick up the patterns uh, that are there, because there will be always some that you didn't expect. And if you just put it exactly to 10, you will certainly uh, group some things together which you wanted to split. Another important remark to make there is the higher dimensional your data becomes, the more clusters you'll need. Uh, because more potential combinations of markers will be present in your data. So for example, if I'm analyzing site of data, I will almost always go to at least a 15 by 15 grid, so with 225 clusters and so on. Um, so that's also something to consider, not only the number, well, it's, it's kind of related. If you have more markers, there will be more potential different populations in there as well. So the next question is from Anna. Uh, she asked that would having channels with little to none variability, not by modal distribu distribution, low signal noise ratio, confuse flow sum? 
If I'm not sure whether the certain marker contributes to clustering, is it safe to leave it out or it won't hurt? Yeah, in that case, um, that's maybe also something interesting to discuss, is that in Flowsum we provide the scale uh, parameter. Um, and if you know that actually all your markers are originally already in a very similar range, I would really recommend to not scale the data. Because then if you have some markers which should be in a similar range, but in practice they're not expressed and they have low variability, they will indeed not influence the algorithm too much and it won't have too much impact. If you know for sure that there isn't any relevant information in there, leave them out. It, it is not adding noise to the system, but it will be limited. However, if your range is very different, for example, if you're combining scatter parameters with some fluorescence measurements, then it's important that you put the scale parameter on. This will apply a z-score uh, scaling to the data to make sure that like the, the mean is put to zero, the standard deviation is put to one, to make sure that all markers have a similar influence uh, on, on the computations. But in that case, your noise will really be increased a lot. So in that case, you really need to be careful and make sure that all your parameters um, are adding relevant signal to the clustering. Got it. Um, so another question addressing to Cytobank is that, can we find the step-by-step flowsum tutorial in Cytobank website? Um, yes, you, you are able to find a lot of support articles with Flowsum on um, our support portal. If you go to support.cytobank.org and search for Flowsum, you will see the Flowsum article that's available. We are also planning to uh, release Flowsum uh, tutorial videos in the near future. So feel free to check back on the website. Another question is in regard to, is there a max limit to number of events in a data set to run Flowsum? Um, so for, for our current testing, we are able to run up to 90 million um, into Flowsum in Cytobank uh, with upgraded compute. Uh, on normal sites like Enterprise and Premium, you are able to run up to 4 million events for Flowsum. That's quite uh, a lot. Compa when comparing to Visni and uh, other um, algorithms. Um, let's see. Hi, Sophie. I really like Frosom. I was just wondering if it is possible to show only a few of the parameters used for clustering in the star charts instead of all of them. Um, I have to be honest, I would need to check in with, uh, with you guys if it's possible to do that on Cytobank as well. Uh, yes, actually. Yeah. Okay. It's also possible in R and actually I, I will often use it myself, especially if you go to bigger and bigger panels, I would not recommend like putting 30 parameters in just one plot that will just be overwhelming. The main idea there is that the markers which you're interested in in co-expression, those you would put together in one plot. So for example, you would then take one plot that for, focuses on, for example, your T-cell markers and another plot that focuses on your B-cell markers. And this way you can start investigating like the parts of your trees one by one, uh, instead of having this overwhelming amount of information with too many little pieces of the pie. Yeah, I will echo with that. Um, so this also answers another question from a user, you know, how many uh, parameters you can show in, in, the, in the star chart or pie chart. So you can show as many as you want, however, uh, to be um, meaningful and to interpret your data well. As Sophie said, you know, you can put, uh, be more thoughtful about what clusters you, what channels you put into your final clustering uh, output. Um, here's another, uh, here's another question that, so Frosom is faster. Is that also due to the last iteration process? Um, so the 
it's it's not really about the iteration process. Um, it it has an influence, but the main speed up is that when you're doing a hierarchical clustering like Spade, actually every cell is compared to every other cell in the data set. So that's then, for example, a million by a million, so you get a huge amount. While in Flowsum, every cell is compared to these cluster centers, which are a kind of like prototype cells, you could say, which means you're comparing a million cells by a hundred values, and that makes a huge difference in speed. So iterations are both involved in Flowsum and, and um, on Spade and so on, but it, it's, yeah, it's a different, it's a different uh, setting, really, on how the clustering is computed. Great. Um, so another question from Madsen. He asked, how are the meta clusters assigned? Um, for the for the meta clustering, um, we com recommend consensus hierarchical clustering. So what happens there is there we use the hierarchical clustering, which I just explained is a slower method of comparing everything to everything. But because we're applying it to our clusters, we're only applying it on 100 or 200 or whatever nodes and not to the millions of cells anymore. Um, we're not just using hierarchical clustering itself, but consensus hierarchical clustering. And the difference there is that it will actually try a few iterations of it to make sure that the results are more robust. Um, so it's, it's a slight adaptation. Got it. So uh, here's a question from Jie. Um, she asked if a DAME antibody marker is included in the clustering channel, would it cause huge inference to the flow sum calculation? In this case, is it better to exclude this marker? Um, if what kind of marker was included, I'm sorry. The, the DAME antibody marker, so meaning oh. probably um, you know, very uh, low expression. Yes, I see. Um, I think that the, the answer is a bit similar to one of the previous questions that in that case, I would certainly recommend um, maybe to not use the scaling if you say like this should have a bit less influence uh, than the other markers. If you do the scaling, maybe it will blow up the effect. Um, and actually then maybe you're spreading your negative population will add too much noise compared to, to this dim signal. Um, however, if you know like there is some signal there and you put a scaling off, I think it can still be reasonable to leave it in. Uh, you would mainly need to be careful with the interpretation of the pie charts uh, in that case, because maybe um, if you see that the pi comes halfway, but in practice you have only a dim marker, this still means like it's in the range of your negative uh, population. Uh, and in that case, and that's I think also very um, possible to do with Cytobank, it's always good to, if you find a cluster of interest, maybe do some backgating, check where the cluster falls in your, in your uh, 2D scatter plots to really couple it back to the way you're used to look at the information and make sure you have the correct understanding. Great. Another question addressed to Sophie is that it is possible to incorporate your cytonorm algorithm to this flow sum analysis to crack for batch effect. What controls would be needed? Um, yeah, so I think at this point, actually, um, like I said, flow sum won't handle batch effects very well. And what you would like to do is apply some normalization procedure, uh, such as, for example, site of norm beforehand um, as a, as a pre-processing step before giving the data to flow sum. Um, in that approach, uh, it, it's still work in progress, so it, it's not published yet what we're doing there. But there we would recommend that you have a control which you actually know is the same across your batches. So you can really learn that all the differences you're seeing there are caused by technical variation and are not any biological heterogeneity you're picking up. Uh, and then from learning which changes are happening there, you can try to um, kind of 
extract them again from the data. So afterwards you have more normalized data and with that you can then move forward to use that as input data in FlowSum. So it's really then a kind of two-step uh, procedure that I would recommend. I see. Um, so the next question is, is it possible to arrange the tree branch position at a later stage according to biological or developmental meanings for those clusters? So my uh, quick answer will be no, you cannot uh, rearrange. And uh, FOSOM is not for developmental uh, analysis. But um, Sophie probably can elaborate a little bit more on that. Yeah, um, I agree there that in general, FLOSOM is not meant to really find these developmental meanings. Sometimes it will approach it a bit, but I think there is a lot of development going on in that area, which will develop algorithms which are taking this much more strictly into account than we're doing with FLOSOM, which was really not intended for this use case. So it can, it can give some first ID, but I would certainly like not to put too much trust in it. Um, to arrange the three branches, um, I think it, it might be possible in theory, maybe in practice, it will be a bit harder to, to actually implement that and, and figure that out. Um, I'm not sure if it would add much added value actually uh, in most situations. I see. Um, so another question from Rihanna I said, how important is the transformation of the data for getting good results with FLOSOM? Is the log scale good enough? And which transformation, logic or arc sign, will be the best? Yeah, I think transformation is very important um, because you can compare it a bit. If you just put the data untransformed in, in uh, a 2D scatter plot, you will also have a very hard time at distinguishing your populations. That's the whole reason we're applying these transformations. So in general, I would kind of say like, what will work easiest for you to see the populations and will also be best uh, for the algorithm. Um, I would recommend using either logical or arc sign H instead of just using log, because I think that's, that's not the, the most optimal for either flow or mass data. Um, for mass data, people will typically use this arc sign H with a cofactor of five. I think in my experience, this works pretty well in most cases. Uh, for flow data, you might need a little more parameter tuning. Um, and there, I think actually both arc sign H and the, the bi-exponential, the logical transformation can give quite similar results. So there, I don't think you can really say that one is much better than the other. I think in most cases, it, it will give a very similar outcome. Mm -hmm. Got you. Um, so I got a few questions regarding you if you can, um, you know, show the cluster, uh, show the dot plots for the particular cluster. And um, so in Cytobank, that's a great uh, implementation we had is that because we have a FlowSum experiment generated after FlowSum analysis so that uh, for each meta cluster and for each clusters, you are able to, um, to interact with the dot plots or whatever, uh, or whatever, you know, you can do the channels, you can do the um, scales, the uh, forward and side scatters uh, to look at each particular cluster. You can even merge the clusters using the automatic gating, uh, cluster gating tools. So yes, you are able to interact the cluster with your uh, bivariate, traditional bivariate dot plots. Um, let's see. So in longitudinal studies with multiple compensation matrix generated, can you still use the same sum for analysis? Um, so in that case, it would be important that the right compensation matrix is of course used for each of the files. Again, there you would need to be quite careful about batch effects. So I would say that in theory it's possible, but you would need to include some extra quality control steps to make sure that the data 
you are merging together is really comparable. I see. Um, here is another question that regard to a comparison of FlowSum with other clustering tool like X clusters. Um, so I think there, if I'm not mistaken, um, that this specific algorithm is a bit better suited to really find rare populations. Like for very small populations, um, FlowSum will probably not be the best. However, I think it will come at a, a huge increase in computational costs. So it really depends on your situation. If you say, okay, for my case, it's really worth it to put in this extra time, or no, I prefer to first have a quick overview and, and then I would go with FlowSum. I see. Um, let's see. Is it possible to upload multiple files to one run of FlowSum? If so, is there a way to analyze the sample of original origin of each meta cluster? And the answer to that is yes, you are able to run multiple files uh, in one FlowSum run inside a bank. And uh, you are able to, as you know, as I said earlier, since we generate a new experiment with all the original files, original FCS file with original uh, channel, uh, marker mark channels, and including the uh, FlowSum meta cluster and the cluster ID channels. So you will be able to analyze the samples of origin of each meta cluster. So that's possible inside the bank. Um, let's see, would um, a question from Robert, would the cellular autofluorescence affect the meta clustering or is that minimum in this analysis? Mm, I think that would be very similar as it, it would be in any other type of, of analysis you do. We're looking for marker pattern, patterns which really like are the same for all markers for cells. Um, and if they have a similar autofluorescence and it's influencing the cells in the same way, probably they, they will get grouped together because it's just one of the patterns that, that's in there. Um, so it will have an influence for sure. Um, I'm not sure, I think how big the influence will, would be will really depend on your panel and on the cells you're measuring. Got it. Um, here's another question regard to running an existing song. So in this case scenario, um, he asked, would you recommend running another full song if you have additional samples for which you expect to have new subsets rather than applying an existing song? Um, it depends on the situation. If you think the cells um, from the new samples will also have been represented in the old sum, I think it, it can make sense to just apply it to the old sum. Um, if you think there might be some new cell types popping up and so on, they, they won't have a spot in the tree yet, so then it might make more sense to really run a new analysis, including all the samples. Got it. Yeah, we have so many questions coming and we actually got quite a lot of them get answered by, Fosom, by Sophie, so that was a great thank you so much, Sophie, um, for helping with all those questions. And due to the time constraint, uh, we're gonna uh, finish the webinar very soon. However, uh, as we said, you know, the webinar um, recording will be available online um, in about a week or so. And also we will address those questions that haven't been answered individually um, by email. So thanks everyone for attending the webinar and thanks very much, Sophie, uh, for your um, generous uh, time and support. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, it's our honor. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Okay, bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>